Yo, what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD, pro physique athlete, back with another episode on Swole Radio. Today, we have the honor of being joined again by Dr. Mike Isertel. He's in the building. Thanks for joining us again, Mike. Only figuratively in the building. <laughs> good to be back. Thank in you for Skype having room. me. So. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about training intensity for hypertrophy. And this has been a long debated subject and pretty controversial in the bodybuilding community. People have a lot of different opinions and we're going to lay some of those to rest. So, yeah, I think, you know, start central to this discussion, just starting off, Mike, how would you define failure and sort of how do you gauge training intensity? There's a bunch of different ways to define failure, but I think there's a very limited number of ways, maybe just one way to define failure that makes the most sense of a, in the context of a discussion when you're talking about competent people who are training to try to get their best results, you know, because there's all sorts of different types of failure that are in a con occur in a context in which you don't want to be anyway. For example, there's a type of failure that says if we put someone into a chest press machine, you have them do as many reps as they can, period. No matter how bad the reps are, no matter how, no matter how awkwardly and terribly they contort their body and how terrible their technique is, even the range of motion might not even might be partial towards the end. As some people would still say that they're still moving. There's other technical ways to say, you know, there's concentric failure, which is the failure to move the bar to one direction. Eccentric failure is when you can no longer even control the descent of the bar. So some people will do forced repetitions where they go to eccentric failure. Uh, I think the best way to define failure in most contexts, it's useful for thinking about bodybuilding training, is technical failure, which is when you are unable to get any more complete repetitions through the desired prescribed range of motion with what you would call a reasonably good technique. If it is a repetition that you can be proud of and a repetition that basically is like, this is good technique, then you do another repetition. If you have to get out of your technique that's pre-described as something you would later in a video go, that's good. If you get into bad technique, you no longer are performing good repetitions, and thus you are already beyond failure. So I would say if you did a great repetition that was a grinder and you did eight reps, if you get the ninth rep, but you really had to wiggle to get it and you got out of your normal range of motion, you do not count the ninth repetition and you say, I reached failure somewhere in the ninth repetition, that is eight successfully recorded repetitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that kind of terminology and that's kind of what I use as well. So, you know, having that set, then in terms of general recommendations, we're gonna get into the weeds with this in terms of the nuances of, you know, closer to failure versus a bit farther away. But in general, what kind of RAR zone in terms of, and that's reps and reserve, is efficient for hypertrophy. Yeah, so we can approach this from two perspectives. One is the high end and one is the low end. So the first question we can ask is, what is too easy? What, How many reps away from failure are so far that it no longer produces robust muscle growth outcomes that can be relatively confidently compared to other ways of training that are also effective. So, you know, it's similar to the distinction of, in many other areas of life that lie in a spectrum that has a, a relatively well understood inflection point. Um, for example, if you told someone, hey, I went on a walk, you know, there is a distance that if you poll enough people, you realize that is the consensus minimum distance to call it a walk. It is unlikely that the distance between your front door and your garage, unless you live in a mansion, is going to be called a walk. You know, like, oh, I went on a walk. You tell your doctor, I've been walking. Where'd you go? Well, I went to my garage. Like, come on, man. No, that doesn't mean you have to walk three miles. But maybe a walk, most people would count like at least the block, you know? 
uh, anything less than a, than a block. Be like, <laughs> no, you just went out and came back. That's not really a walk. Long walks to the fridge don't count as cardio. But exactly, right? So um, for relative effort, which is the technical term that we use, um, we actually, uh, mostly people are trying to issue the term intensity because intensity um, is also, relative intensity is technically defined in lifting as a percent of one repetition max. Relative effort is how hard did you try relative to how hard you could have tried. And the you could have tried maximally hard, you reach technical failure. So that's the end of that is failure. But the beginning of where it starts to affect hypertrophy very robustly is probably, it depends on the, the age of training of the trainee, the training age, the level of advancement, beginner, intermediate, or advanced. The conversation is something like four reps in reserve. For very uh, new beginners, uh, for five or six repetitions away from failure, you can get very comparable results to training much closer to failure. Mm. For people that are more advanced, it's probably more like three reps from failure that really is where the games start to come, uh, or rather the uh, kind of the S-curve, which you can map gains onto with relative effort, starts to plateau out is right around three, and then you don't get much more incremental gains going to two, one, and zero. So something like three or four reps in reserve, if you train at least that hard, there are many critiques that could be leveled against your training, but the fact that you're not trying hard enough in any given set is probably not a reasonable critique. Um, you know, like it's it's almost, uh, what's a good analogy here? If you take someone to, you know, the average girl that you like to a restaurant that costs $700 per plate, there are many reasons that the relationship did not continue. But it is unlikely that the fanciness of the, of, of fanciness of the restaurant was one of them, right? So, uh, you know, past some point, we can say training effort is hard enough to cause robust gains in most cases. And that point is uh, roughly three or four reps in reserve on average. And it changes a little bit case by case, but not a ton. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you brought up that concept of the S-curve. And, you know, I think... This is something I've been curious about. Like, how would you sort of characterize that, the shape of that curve in terms of how stimulus changes as you get closer to failure? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, that S curve changes with training age, et cetera. But if we just take an intermediate lifter, for example, I think in many cases, that S curve from the point at which you get roughly zero gains to uh, you know to the first time you detect a rise an exponential rise and then mm -hmm. a reverse exponential fall off to a plateau it's a typical s curve i would say that s curve is probably something like six to ten repetitions long which is to say that if you are lifting a weight that's your 20 rep max and you lift it only for 10 repetitions as an intermediate you may be so you you're just behind where the s curve kind of starts to get its first inflection and <clears throat> the number of sets it would require to cause robust hypertrophy may be comically large you still probably see an effect after enough mechanical tension, but it's like a little too ridiculous to consider. So technically, it's not really an S-curve. There's a slow increase all the way from, you know, any number of reps that you do. But about 10 repetitions before you go to failure, the S-curve starts rising. And if you're on this bottom part, yeah, you can train six or seven reps away from failure, but it's just going to take a lot of sets to accrue enough hypertrophic stimulus. As you get to five or six repetitions away from failure, you're on that ascension. And that means going seven reps away versus four reps away is a very big difference in hypertrophy outcome per set. Mm -hmm. That's you're on that steep ascension of that exponential. And then as the S-curve starts to flatten out at three, two, and one reps, yes, it's probably true that set for set for set in a vacuum, in a one session exposure, going two reps is better than three reps from fail. One rep is a little better than two. And zero failure, zero RIR, very similar, is maybe 
very small amount more effective than one rep away from failure. But nonetheless, it's really starting to flatten out. And uh, there's arguably nothing more to get from that by going beyond failure, et cetera, if you compare these things in a vacuum. They're rarely in a vacuum, so there's more to say about that because the dynamic changes if you expose the body to multiple sequential workouts in a row. And that is important probably to talk about later because mm -hmm. you don't train once. And if you look at research that says, well, one exposure we compared a group of people and the people that went real close to failure got more muscle growth stimulus than the people that went a little further from failure. Yes, that's a very good point. But how much fatigue do they accumulate? And if they had to come back again and again and again and again, could they continue to replicate that hard work? Or would they be so close to failure early that they would peter out and actually get worse results over the long term? We do in fact, see the latter happening. But in essence, yeah, there is something to be said for even as far as 10 repetitions back. Yeah. But the efficiency is insanely low. And then somewhere around five repetitions, you see kind of the middle of that inflections point. So I think training people six repetitions away from failure and four repetitions away from failure would probably cause the biggest difference between any two points on that map. You know, 11 versus uh, nine, almost nothing different uh you know one versus two or one versus three almost nothing different mm. six versus four you're taking big leaps there getting mm. onto that ascending part of the curve and really increasing the amount of hypertrophy you get for how close you get to failure mm -hmm. okay so yeah so basically stimulus versus intensity is something like uh say an s-shaped curve where you you're really getting the peak effect or the steepest curve somewhere around three to four reps. And then as you get really get close to failure, it starts flattening out. And then what does the relationship then look like for fatigue as you get closer to failure? Yeah, so fatigue, um, we don't have a whole lot of direct literature on this, but the observations, they have plenty of indirect literature. And the observations from the field, from the people that are cognizant enough of this phenomenon, coaches, athletes, is that the expen the, the fatigue uh, relationship for those last 10 repetitions seems to be pretty close to exponential, directly exponential. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we, we definitely have good reason to believe that it's not linear. So going all the way to failure doesn't add the same amount of relative fatigue that the difference between four reps from fail and three reps from fail gives you. If you look at the fatigue curve, you get a relatively low amount of fatigue going anywhere shy of five reps away from failure. And at around five, it starts to climb up. And at around between one and zero, it's already on a huge slope such that training three to four reps away from failure so you have pretty robust stimulus but relatively low fatigue training two or three reps away from failure gives you almost certainly a better stimulus but with a concomitantly high level of fatigue or maybe even a little bit higher relative fatigue training one or zero reps away from failure gives you a linearly bigger stimulus but by a small linear slope very it's it, it's now the exponential that goes the other way it's a hyperbolic curve on the other hand the fatigue is going up at a huge slope so if we were to say look you always got to train to failure we have to contend with the fact that the ratio of stimulus to fatigue for failure training can't possibly measure up to the ratio of stimulus to fatigue for training two reps in reserve because two reps in reserve causes almost the same amount of growth as failure training on average, but uh, it causes way, way less fatigue. Mm -hmm. And in one session, that doesn't matter because the fatigue won't proximately interfere with hypertrophy unless you accumulate a ton of volume. So you'll be totally fine in that regard. But if you have to come back two, three days later and repeat a similar workout and progress even further, your cumulative fatigue is a summation in some sense of the fatigue you expose yourself to any one workout. If you're exposing yourself to two RIR fatigue, you're adding up little bits of fatigue that are relatively small. If you expose yourself to zero RIR fatigue, you're adding very large chunks of fatigue and you're only adding a very small stimulus for that. And thus it becomes much less sustainable to do 
and it becomes less of a good idea if your idea of good training is the stringing together of several weeks of good workouts. And we know from about 50 other sources, both direct and indirect, the only way to get your biggest is to string together weeks of good workouts. Nobody gets big in one workout. That it seems apparent that training all the way to failure at least needs to be mitigated somehow or contextualized, done occasionally, is probably just from that level of analysis. And we can, of course, look at what happens in the real world to corroborate it just from that level of analysis should at least pose theoretical problems in your head and say, gee, you know, really doesn't seem a good idea. It's similar to the idea of, um, you know, uh, in space travel, of course, theoretical, uh, you know, going 0.8 uh, the speed of light takes an unbelievable amount of energy and it gets you there relative to whatever 0.8 speed. Going to 0.9 speed or 0.95 speed is a linear increase in speed. It's like if you're driving 80 miles an hour on the freeway, someone passes you going 95. But wherever you guys are going, they'll get there sooner. But if it's like an hour drive, they'll get there a few minutes before you. It's not like they'll get there days before you or in 10 seconds where you would have gotten there in an hour. However, the amount of energy required to propel an object from 0.8C to 0.95C starts to hit that exponent and it may be triple or quadruple the energy. And like triple or quadruple the energy to go 0.15 times faster, like we better be in a real big rush to justify that. Um, and so the reality is like the human body can be seen as a spaceship that has a finite amount of fuel and a finite amount of ability to re you know refuel. So if you're going to go that close to the speed of light all the time, you had better have big fuel tanks. And most people fatigue wise just can't take that kind of beating to justify that level of fatigue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to look at it where you need to think about these variables in terms of not just one workout, but, you know, string across multiple workouts in multiple weeks where ultimately we're trying to optimize the amount of total productive volume and, you know, the, the length of our productive vessel cycle in aggregate. Sure. 100%. So, yeah, so it's like, you know, it follows then that as you get closer to failure, like if you're trying to fail all the time, you're not going to be able to train with as much volume or have as long of a mesocycle. So if someone was in an ideal scenario where like, like they have as much time to train as necessary, what's kind of your recommendation in terms of the RAR they should be aiming for, for the most part? Yeah, so people who don't have a lot of time to train are in an interesting situation. Mm -hmm. They are in a situation in which they need lots of stimulus. Put another way, they need all the stimulus they can get because their time is constraining how much stimulus they can deliver because they just don't have time to do as many sets as you would need to get all the stuff you need out of two RR sets, for example. And on the other hand, they have a benefit. And the benefit is that because they're so constrained on volume, they actually can't do the physical summation of enough fatigue for it to matter as much. Mm -hmm. So they have a big fatigue window and a very small window in which to do the stimulus. So for them, relatively speaking, of course, the less time you have relative to how much time you would need to do a workout long enough to where you're not constrained by time, then <clears throat> the more beneficial it becomes to push those uh, failure proximity is very close to or to zero. So if someone says, look, I'm trying to get my best gains. I have 30 minutes, three times a week to train. What do I do? How many RIRs do I do? A generally fine idea is just go to failure and everything. And then if they're reading some literature or listening to podcasts like yours, they could say, well, hold on, doesn't that accumulate a lot of fatigue? And you give them the crooked eye and you go, how much fatigue do you think you'll accumulate training 30 minutes a day, three times a week? And they're like, not enough to write home about? Like, yeah, exactly. So then that extra 15% of growth is definitely worth it because the fatigue is a non-issue. But in the context of folks that are like you, professional bodybuilders, you know, gee, you got the time to train, but the handling the fatigue is the real big limiting factor. And I will say, 
from the perspective of the other side of things where, you know, use of uh, anabolic enhancement and so on and so forth, there used to be a few hypotheses as to why anabolics were effective mm -hmm. in building muscle. Nowadays, we have the answers to most of them. One of the older ones was, well, they don't really change anything except to just give you more aggression to be able to train harder. Anyone who's really gotten to the level of using anabolics and has gotten very large can tell you how hard you train is just not a limiting factor in most cases. It is, can you recover? And these, these substances do give very, very profound recovery benefits. Now, they help in other ways that are not those two things. But at the end of the day, recovery is such a big limiting factor that that ends up being the big thing, which is why training to failure consistently for most people who are seriously involved in sport and not time constrained is probably, I don't know, let's be charitable, at least requires a second thought. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting, you know, seeing how the go hard or go home sort of paradigm has perpetuated in bodybuilding. And it kind of makes sense that, as you said, like for people who are short on time, that uh, which actually does practically apply to a lot of people, that it actually does make sense to train to failure. And I think for a lot of, you know, average people who have jobs and families and only train a few times a week that they really want to be training intensely. Absolutely. And, and there's other stuff to take away from how they should train. They should train compound large muscle mass exercises. Like it's the worst thing. I, I remember seeing people when I was a personal trainer, seeing people who just trained with personal trainers a few times a week doing like cable one arm rear delt laterals. And I'm like, oh my God, what are you? Never, the RIR was eight or something. But it's like, what are you doing training a muscle the width of your thumb? Like you could be doing barbell bent rows, training that muscle and 16 other muscles that are 10 times bigger. You just, it's just a very poor use of time. So if you are time constrained, yes, go to failure or very close to it. But also there's a bunch of other stuff to do, like taking their much shorter rest breaks in the gym and so on and so forth. But yeah, outside, I'm, I'm sorry to digress. That's outside the scope of the current conversation. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that I wondered about is... You know, you see a lot of anecdotal ev like evidence stories of people saying, you know, I got great results with a very low volume, high intensity approach. And maybe they're professional bodybuilders or just have had very good success. How much of that do you think is, you know, just kind of the the way that, you know, they, they could be doing better if they backed off a little bit on intensity and did more volume? Um, and do you think there is any sort of um, just like variability in people's responses where you have some, you know, high intensity responders, so to speak? Yeah. There's a lot to say about that. Let's run down the list of, this is not going to be a comprehensive list, but at least enough to get people thinking. Mm -hmm. First, it's not clear if they're making the correct attribution to begin with. What you have to realize as a scientifically minded person is that when a person says, you know, I got better results doing this method than that method, I got better results doing low volume, high intensity training than I did doing high volume RIR training. You have to ask if those were the only two variables that changed. Mm. And it's very possible that they were not the two variables, that only two variables that changed, that other things changed too. They might have now been in a different city with a different girlfriend or boyfriend that caused them less stress. They might have eaten more. Something that's uh, pretty clear in the literature is that if you train with a very high training volume, it can actually impair your appetite by bringing you into an overreach state. Maybe it wasn't the fact that they were training differently, but the fact that they trained less and allowed them to not overload their systemic abilities too much. They kept their appetite higher and then they were able to gain more body weight and thus have much greater results. There's another thing where it's a psychological element. They could have liked training hard and very close to failure with low volume more, and thus they were more consistent with it. They didn't skip as many workouts. That could have led to better results. There could be variables of androgen use, variables of age and maturation, variables of changing nutritional strategy, having a different job that requires less cardio, there are, of course, volume differences. My big thing I used to harp on, and I think is still relatively true, is that everyone has a slightly and sometimes greatly dis different 
margin of where they grow their best. And that's sort of the window between your minimum effective volume and your maximum recoverable volume. If someone was doing what they call an RIR program, and they were doing 20 sets of back roughly every week, but their maximum recoverable volume was somewhere in that 18 to 20 range, they could have been chronically overreaching for a very long time. And if not overreaching, training on the tail end of that, they could have been doing tons and tons of work for very marginal gains. If they went, said, okay, I'm going to failure and I'm going to do fewer sets. The failure part isn't even that interesting. It's the fact that they did fewer sets that took them closer to their, their maximum adaptive volume. Maybe now they're doing more like 12 sets. And it turns out their minimum effective volume is eight sets. And the 12 sets is right in that sweet spot of being on average, much better answer and giving them much better growth. The thing about low volume, high intensity training, that is, I think, most important to intellectually note before concluding from people's anecdotes, which are, of course, valuable in context, mm -hmm. is that you're talking about two things and it feels like you're talking about one. It's like when someone says, like, hey, I brushed my hair and I brushed my teeth and I went on a date and it was awesome. Brushing my teeth was a great decision. It's like, maybe. How do you know it wasn't your hair? I'm like, who cares about brushed hair? Like, well, maybe she cares about it. You know, like, you don't know because you did two things. So when people say, listen, like, the RIR thing is stupid. I trained like that. But when I went high intensity, heavy duty or dog crap or whatever program, I got great results. My next question to them is, how much volume did you do in that old program? How many sets? And how much are you doing in this program? And almost always the answer is they did way fewer sets. And if it was way fewer sets, then it's like, well, maybe the failure proximity didn't change much. It's the fact that you were doing fewer sets that you were doing too many before. Mm -hmm. Another idea is if they answer, well, actually, I'm doing the same number of sets, but I'm going closer to failure. Then my answer back to them is, well, have you tried doing even more sets, but far from failure? Because if the same number of sets, let's say 10 sets, you used to do three RIR, now you do zero RIR. And zero RIR for the past two months, just straight up getting you better gains. Maybe your maximum adaptive volume, the place where you get the most gains, is kind of like 15 sets. And 10 sets all the way to failure gives you roughly the same growth as maybe 12 sets would three reps away from failure. But if because you normally do 10 sets, it's just so off, far off that you are better off pushing that effort in some capacity. Ideally, you would push it in their capacity of just doing more like 15 sets at 2 RIR. You would get the best of both worlds, even more superior growth than the high intensity style training, but an even lower fatigue cost. So whenever people say, hey, listen, I got my best results doing, you know, let's say eight sets a week, but hard as fuck, super close to failure. My often my response to them is that sounds really good. How about we start you next mesocycle if they give me the reins to their training at eight sets per week, but like three reps in reserve. And then as we decrease the uh, reps in reserve, increasing the relative effort over the weeks, let's also add a few sets here and there and see if we can't get you to something like 12. See how you grow best in that range. And often they'll find out that like, actually, fuck, man, I seem to grow my best with like 12 sets, but like two reps in reserve on average. Well, that's awesome. And it turned out that turning the dial on the sets was what actually did it. Because there is a sense in which there are two ways to solve the problem of an insufficient stimulus. There's many others, but just two of them are prominent here. One is doing more. And two is taking what you're doing and doing it harder. That second one comes with a, a fatigue nastiness. Uh, let me give you a, a very good, a very good, I'm grading my own analogies ahead of time on a conceited thing to do. I, have, I should say a, a technically very applicable analogy to drive this point home. Somebody could say, this actually happens all the fucking time. This literal thing also happens in bodybuilding. People will say, you got a dirty bulk, bro. I ate clean for a year and fucking nothing happened, man. I started dirty bulking and I got crazy gains, strength, size, veins, everything. Like, I got you. So what do you mean by that? Like, what were you doing? They're like, well, dude, instead of those broccoli, rice, and chicken shit, this whole plate of bullshit, I just eat a fucking cheeseburger. And if I just replace my plate of bullshit with a fucking cheeseburger, I get better gains. They're like, I got you. So what they did was they took the same plate of food, 
one plate, one item, and they expanded the calorie density in those calorie volume. That's one way to solve that problem because the problem is that they just weren't under eating calories. There's another way to solve that problem. Just eat two plates of chicken, broccoli, and rice. You get all the high quality nutrients that cheeseburger doesn't give you, a better macro profile, but you solve the calorie problem. So instead of going from two sets, that's too many at two RIR, and going to one set that really, really close to failure, maybe you can start at a set, or sorry, you can say, three sets, you know, that you're doing two RIR versus one set to failure, try two sets at like two RIR that may be a better solution than the one set close to failure, which may still be better than three sets really far from failure because that, that could just be too much, right? So there's a middle ground there essentially intellectually to simplify the issue. Under stimulus is what we're trying to address or over stimulus is what we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. There's two ways to address them. One is by modulating RIR, one is by modulating volume. But because we have really good research on RIR and how that works, it's much less likely that that's a thing we should be modulating. An average mesocycle to RIR, man, for most people, that's just going to be the sweet spot. However, there's no concomitant statement you can make about volume. As a matter of fact, from the evidence-based sort of general understanding, what is that number of roughly two RIR? It's actually roughly between 10 and 20 sets. Holy crap, that's a yeah. big range, yeah. right? And that's much more opportunity for you to move that needle and get your optimum volume, knowing that your relative effort is already something that you kind of know how to do it from, from the get-go. And so going back to the food analogy real quick, bodybuilders know that if you can't gain on a plate of chicken and rice, try two plates before you try the cheeseburger. There may be times to try the cheeseburger, but we modulate with a certain known good quality, like going to 2RIR or like eating clean food. We know that we should modulate the amount of that, like the number of sets or the number of plates, before we say, fuck it, it's time for pizza, or fuck it, it's time to go all the way to failure all the time. But if you want to train all the way to failure and eat pizza, I've got a pizza failure RP training program on my Instagram right now. Sign up. First five users get free pizza and a dumbbell. <laughs> Just one dumbbell. That's all you need, bro. You got to train hard enough. You just go to failure. Yeah, no, that was a really nuanced discussion that I enjoyed. And yeah, I like how you pointed out that, you know, volume has probably has a lot more of a sort of excursion in terms of how much people can play around with it and often people don't really factor in that they could have been doing too much before i want to get into a couple of more nuanced questions with in training intensity and rir first one was in terms of your proximity to failure do you think the curve looks different for different muscle groups i wonder i think that it there's no compelling reason for me to suspect that it does at a deeper level but at a more surface level we could surmise that your ability to take certain muscle groups closer to their real failure point could be different mm. so i'd say before we try to ascertain if the different muscles have some kind of intrinsic architectural or compositional qualities that say that the quads really do benefit from close to failure training the hamstrings we have to equate for how much relative effort is delivered to the muscle so for example how hard is it to get your biceps to get close to failure I mean, it's hard it hurts but you can do it how hard is it to get your quads close to failure mm -hmm. gee you know you gotta really wake up for that shit and some people just not gonna do that Another one is how hard is it get is it to get close to failure when the end point of the range of motion is difficult to determine? What exactly is failure in a hip thrust? I mean, there's that hip thrust that clicks at the top, your hips really go through and stick and hold. But then there's other hip thrusts that look like pretty close to the same range of motion. They can't maintain that hold. So it's kind of people will say, Well, I really need to go much closer to failure with my glutes than I do with my biceps. But in a bicep curl, telling what's failure and what's not is really obvious. It just stops right here. But with glute thrusts, there may be 
five or even more repetitions, which are so close to what you call failure based on how you catalog what that aim end range of motion is that you might have to just push and push and push a little further than normal to guarantee that you're not just slacking off and going, you know, I think that's high enough that I didn't go high enough. There's no check mark to say you sure did it. That's why with something like pull-ups and as many exercises as possible, establishing a standardization is really good to where if you hit a certain range of motion, that's a checked rep. If you don't, that's not a checked rep. So that can help clear that air. And then underneath that whole thing, now you're working with equivalent failures. There could be differences uh, in muscle stuff. Another thing is it could be maybe not so much related to muscles, but to exercises for and, and how you catalog failure is important in that regard. So for barbell bent over rows, when you fail in barbell bent over rows, you're failing at the point in which the exercise is mechanically least advantageous and most difficult to do. Your muscles that pull various muscles of your back and your delts and your biceps, they may have quite a bit of juice left in them, just not enough juice to take you to that top portion. Okay, so they could be trying maximally when you do fail at the rep, but hypothetically, you could have a different exercise that adjusts for that and really exposes the muscles to more difficulty through a range of motion in which kind of even the beginning of a concentric movement is the point at which they reach failure. For example, the prime row, if you put, you know what a prime row machine is? You ever seen one of those? Hmm. It's like a, you know, it's like a lever row, chest supported row, and you can set the weight at various pins. And the number three pin is one in which it is really difficult at the bottom of the movement but very easy at the top when you lock out. Failure on a prime row looks like it's five reps beyond failure and everything else, because as long as you get that first part moving, it gets easier after. The amount of local fatigue your muscles of your back can experience at the end of a prime row to failure is a little bit of a world away from a bent row. In a bent row, you like can't touch the tummy, and you're like, eh. Ta-da, I'm done. And you're tired and you're breathing heavy, but you're like, I don't know, man. I feel like if you give my muscles a slightly less and less range of motion, I could keep doing something with them. They're not totally fatigued, totally inundated with metabolites. But in a prime row set at the right position, Jesus, you're going to get all the way to you can't even lift the, anything at all. And that means that you got way closer to that muscle's failure. So I think there's a big difference in some exercises. And ideally... If we want to have lower repetition, sorry, lower numbers of sets, slightly more efficiency to our training, we can choose exercises that are conducive to our force curves of our bodies, such that the last couple of reps really just take every goddamn thing out of that muscle. Some exercises are not made uh, like that, and some are, and the ones that are generally tend to be a little bit uh, more effective per set on average uh, lots of caveats there but that's generally how it is now for individual muscles like do the gastroc muscles uh need to be taken to one rir whereas the latissimus muscles are totally fine with three rir i'm uh, nothing i have observed in my own training and the answer to me is open is open question uh, that's a very fancy academic way of saying i have no clue <laughs> Yeah, I like how you pointed out that you can, depending on how you execute or the exercises that you specifically choose, like failure can mean different things in terms of the amount of stimulus you're getting out of it um, for that particular move. In terms of a question I commonly get, when you're doing multiple sets, say you're doing three or four sets of an exercise, should you be targeting like the exact same RER across those sets as in maybe letting the reps drop off or does it matter in terms of whether you just kind of aim for the same number of reps and say your first set was like a four IR and your last set was like one or two? Yes. Good, good question. I'm not sure this is the correct answer, but this is my best guess. And my best guess is it by a small margin probably pays to target a similar RIR every single set and make either load or repetition adjustments to fill in the blanks. Why? Because 
if you zoom in and you say to yourself, okay, I want to get in this workout, let's just pick a random week, two RIR. That's the week I'm in. I want to get it because last week I did three RIR and I want more of a progressive challenge, more load, more reps, whatever. And I know that I have to get close to failure in my last week in order to make sure I'm not bullshitting myself. Because one thing we haven't touched on is I'm not a big fan of just doing like picking an RIR and doing it forever. Like two RIR, weeks and weeks on end. Your mind can lie to you. I think roughly every mesocycle, you have to get close to failure to test whether or not your RIR prediction is even true. Because you could say to yourself two RIR, but by the end of a meso, it's really six RIR. You just got lazy. And especially as fatigue accumulates, it's very easy to just be like, yeah, that's hard enough. Like, is it though? You know, you often train with a partner and he pushes you and you get six more reps on your leg press. And you're like, I guess I just haven't been trying, which is like, that sucks, right? So let's say we assume that logic and we say, okay, two RIR is the goal. And we're doing five sets for an exercise. Can we do a two RIR average, which is like the first set is maybe five RIR and the last set is all the way to failure or can we should we just do something like two rir well hold on a sec let's find out we know that there is a progressive element and an overloading element of training if last week you hit an average of three rir and then today you do a work set your first work set that's 10 reps and you're very fresh so it's five rir how much hypertrophic stimulus will you be getting out of that set? It is two things. One, pretty damn far down on the RIR scale, already not very stimulative. And also because you've progressively exposed in that exact exercise your body to four and then three and then now hopefully two RIR, that five RIR set, it kind of sucks. Like it's kind of very understimulative in that context. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the last set. That's zero RIR. The reason we're going to RIR is because we need a little bit more of a challenge than last week's three RIR, but we also need it to be robust and very stimulative, but not so stimulative that fatigue's living crap out of us. What does a zero RIR set do for you? I mean, it definitely checks that stimulus box. We didn't need to go to zero. We could have gotten great results from two. So, okay, it's overkill, but hey, we'll take the great gains. Linear gains, slightly higher gains. But then how do we answer for the insanely high excess fatigue? Yeah. Even that one set to failure, but geez, that's a lot. And you know, because you and I both actually train with weights and don't just read papers, going to true failure is a psychological fight, especially for those of us that have, you know, childhood demons and shit like that. <laughs> you go to failure, you know, that's a war in there somewhere. And it because you really try. There's going to health club failure, which is like you're curly, you're like, oh, that's it. And then there's like legit bodybuilder failure, which is like, like it's everything you've got. That's a lot of fatigue. And the last week of training, sure, you don't have anything to to train for. You get a deload after. But as a RIR two week, the first set that's five RIR, Jesus, it's not a high quality set. The last set is just too much and too poisonous with fatigue. But if we hit every set roughly at 2RR, it's like the Goldilocks zone of just right. Mm -hmm. I have an analogy for this in case someone out there is not already sick of my stupid fucking analogies. Uh, I think it's also a decent analogy. Let's say aliens bake you a a sheet of muffins. And they know that on average, humans like the muffins to be golden brown. But they're like, it's on average. It's okay. Some of the muffins are straight up undercooked. You eat the shit, you get like dysentery because the dairy is not processed. And you're like, ah, I'm going to die. Salmonella muffin. And then a couple of the muffins are perfect. But then a couple are burnt to a fucking crisp. They're like black. <laughs> I mean, the aliens watch you eat them and they're like, was that pleasant? And you're like, not really. And they're like, why not? It is average of golden brown. You're like, right. No, I see what you're saying. But it's more important to get everything golden brown (laughs) and the average it matters. But there's this thing where the average just doesn't do enough. So I think in this context, viewing the frat perspective, I would prefer to have things clustered around that week's target for RIR and get me in that good range. And I think in the simpler terms, if you have 
multiple sets in a row and you're trying to hit an average RIR, you risk having some sets that are understimulative and just not really worth your time. Because you like do a first set of 10 or you have to do, let's say, six sets of 10 at the same weight. You're like, that was easy as fuck. Like someone's like pretty good set. You're like, not really. It's just another warm up set as far as I'm concerned. And then that last set is like a fight for your life grinder. And someone's like, you know, you could have had literally less cumulative fatigue from this workout and more benefits if you just did every set of two RIR or so than doing one at five, one at one, and everything in between. So that's kind of my piece de resistance. Yeah. No, I like my muffins golden brown, so. <laughs> Damn aliens. They'll never <laughs> understand us, Bill. That's why we have to go to war with them. <laughs> Independence Day. That's how that started. And then another thing that I think people, you know, probably know you for. How would you optimally cycle RAR in a mesocycle? Say, say we're talking about someone who's been training for a while, like they're intermediate to advanced, and they have enough time where they can do as much volume as they need. And say they're doing kind of a mid-length mesocycle, like six weeks of accumulation. Sure. There are many ways to do this, and I think that one RIR and you just pick the RIR and you just go is totally fine, but I think we can do a little bit better than totally fine. And for that, we need to consider the perspective of what do we need at first and what do we need at the end? At first, we're in a position that we just deloaded. That was our last week. Mm -hmm. And potentially we change some repetition ranges. We change the exercises somewhat. There's a lot of novelty to that stimulus. And thus the question of how hard does each set really need to be to give you really good gains? The answer to that is not that hard, not as hard as usual. Mm -hmm. The amount of gains you get from your average mid mezzo two RIR set, you could gain similar gains at the beginning of the mezzo at four RIR, just because you haven't been exposed to it yet. You're very sensitive to hypertrophy. So you can just get away with getting great gains at four reps in reserve. This, by the way, mirrors itself on a continual training age cycle from beginner to intermediate advanced. People say beginners need to train harder and go to failure. Why? They get amazing results going five reps away from failure. Leave them the hell alone. Like, why do they need to get injured and tired from doing failure training? Same idea. You're a little bit more of a beginner when you're at the beginning of a mess cycle. Okay. Okay, fine. Let's say we accept that. The next question is, why don't we just keep going a four RIR? It's a fine idea, but you know, you want some progression. You want things to get incrementally harder. Your body gets used to the same stimulus. It accommodates. So you want to kind of progressively expose your body to slightly harder things. But geez, that's like one of the most fundamental things about training is the overload principle. As you increase the weight and repetitions you're trying to do, fatigue inevitably goes up. And unless you want to decrease your performance, which countervails the overload idea, you're probably going to end up going closer and closer and closer to failure anyway. So you can plan it ahead of time and be like, this week I'm shooting for roughly four RIR, next week three or four, week after that two or three, week after that two or one, week after that one or zero, week after that I fail everything, and then I deload. So that makes some sense. There should be a progressive element, so we know there's good reason to start easier, there's good reason to progress, and you could say, okay, I progress, but when I get like to about two RIR, like that's optimal. Why would I go further than that? Why would I go to one? Why would I go to zero? And that's a very good question. And the answer isn't always like, yeah, but you should still do it because the answer could be like, I don't do it. However, the other answer is you got to check if you're actually going as close to failure as you think you are. We have very good data, reams of that shit to suggest that a bunch of different people in a bunch of different contexts just wildly off base in how close to failure they think they are. A small minority of them go much closer to failure than they think. They'll say, I have three reps in reserve and it's really zero. <laughs> like, I can do three more. You've spotted, no doubt, many people in the bench row. So like, three more, and then they drop the bar on themselves. You're like, I guess that's zero, idiot. <laughs> and rack that for you. But that's not very common. Much more common is people thinking, oh, I have three more, but you get in their ear and you're like, you're a pussy, do more reps. And they do six or seven. And you're like, oh, you could do more. And they're like, yeah, okay, that was interesting. Huh? I didn't know that I had more in me. So in order to test yourself and to make sure that you're honoring this idea of actually training as close to failure as you think, it's good to push it. 
and you say, but hold on, if you push it, you'll experience a lot of cumulative fatigue. True. But if you're going to deload the next week anyway, I don't want to say who cares, but it's a smaller price to pay. You've got plenty of time to give that fatigue a go. There are some theoretical bases on which through endurance and strength sport, we understand that functional overreaching is something that happens. If you push your body a little bit beyond the week later, it can reconstitute and make changes that give an even bigger boost. Mm -hmm. And there are some reasons, faint ones for now, to suspect that they might happen in hypertrophy training. So if there's no huge downside from going close to failure, and it reinforces the idea that you're really as close to failure as you think, and there's a potential upside of some delayed uh, hypertrophy from that overreaching effect, or sorry, the um, uh, what's that called, uh, super compensation effect, uh, functional overreaching, then that starts to think like, okay, well, maybe then that makes sense to go to failure. I can think of at least one reason, uh, one situation in which you wouldn't do that and one reason not to. If you are successfully getting really high quality sets, you're progressing in load, your systemic fatigue from most other muscles is starting to build, you haven't hit anywhere close to failure yet, but you're getting awesome pumps, awesome soreness. Everything's going great. I just wouldn't fuck with it. And you could end something at question mark RIR. For example, let's say you're doing leg presses and you're getting into the last week of your training phase. Mm -hmm. Every week you added 10 pounds to the leg press and your reps have gone unchanged and your neural and architectural adaptations are sinking in. She whiz me. You're just crushing it. Every single time you have a great workout, you're locked in. Your technique feels incredible. The mind muscle connection is incredible. Your joints feel incredible. You've gone from leg pressing 365 all the way to 405 by 10 pound increments over the last several weeks. And you've done sets of 12. Your quads are sore every time. You know that good, good soreness, that deep shit. Barely recover on time. You're in your last week. Should you put 415 on the bar and go as all out as you could. I mean, you might get 18 reps. My question back is for what? Like why? If you know that you just do one extra set or even one extra rep in each set, 13 reps instead of 12 at 415, you're guaranteed to get massive quad soreness for the next five days. Thank God you're deloading because your workout would have been in four days. You would have missed that one. So you're getting this amazing thing why push it? And the answer to that is like, don't push it. Just do a little more than last time and coast on through. In case, is, 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 am I, is it okay if I make these dating and sex analogies? Or are you tired of the shit? Is this a family? Is this yeah, a family great. show? Okay, great. I got one more for you then. <laughs> the analogy here is how to progress in stimulus through a consensual sexual encounter with uh, <laughs> whatever sex partner you're into, same sex, opposite sex, whatever, right? So here it is. Like, if you meet a girl in the club and she straight grabs your dick, you're like, bro, easy. You know what I'm saying? You got to <laughs> ease into some shit. So at first, making out hot, amazing. It's doing everything for you. But if you're both trying to nut, yeah, at some point, making out just doesn't cut the mustard. You're not in high school anymore. You need to, they need to go to more serious shit. So you get into some whatever, gentle, touching, blah, blah, blah. And then there's an intensity to that. Let's say you're banging, right? You know, is it, you know, if you're trying to nut, at some point, you got to escalate the stimulus intensity. So, like, at some point, a girl's like, let's say she's fucking, you know, giving you a hand jump. She's like, yeah, you love that? You're like, yes. She's like, oh, are you going to nut? You're like, not at this rate, bitch. You feel me? You're going to be here for eight hours. Like, you got to, because I'm, you know, I'm, I have strong hands. You know, I'm used to myself. You got to put a little more oomph into that. Right? And if she knows what she's doing, she's going to escalate the intensity anyway. But, to, so that's the first part of that whole getting close to failure analogy. But, so the progression is there, right? However, even that last part makes sense with, in that regard. Let's say you're at that point where you're like, I don't know, let's say like whatever. Okay, this is getting gross, but like she's giving you head or some shit like that. And and she's like at the perfect pace. Where like you know, like you're gonna fucking not lay like, it's happening for sure. And you wanna like telepathically be like, don't change anything, goddammit. Just do exactly what you're doing for another 20 seconds and we're golden. Right? That's that example of that leg press that's just going perfectly. If she notices you're about to not and she increases that stimulus intensity, 
you know, it could be too much. You're like, whoa, 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 easy. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> you know, where it's like, why, why we had this perfect thing and you ruined it. So at the end of the day, that whole thing fits together in a very similar way. You start easy, you add in progression as needed to keep the stimulus going. And then towards the end, you add the cherry on top if you have to. But if you're already coasting to amazing gains, fuck adding the cherry on top. You're clear anyway. Just keep doing what you're doing. Ta-da. Wow. <laughs> Speechless. <laughs> That's how, you know what I'm saying? That's how you'll be left if you get the proper blowjob, I guess. I don't even know what the <laughs> hell I'm saying anymore. Good God. <laughs> you thought when you thought the muffin analogy was good. <laughs> <laughs> What is this podcast even about? I don't even know. Anyway, you know, a lot of these principles apply to all sorts of other things. That's just the shit that pops in my head. Hey, muffins, um, central sex, we're, we're really living it up. We're talking about, you know, our the best things in life. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, I guess one last little nuanced question in terms of actual practical implementation. You know, to get that... So, sort of overreaching effect that's in a functional way that we can, you know, take advantage of our deep load. In your last week of training, how much like failure do you use? Like, would you take every set of every workout for the whole week to failure or just kind of, you know, the last couple workouts or? That's a really good question. The first part of that answer is nothing will replace experience. Some people can take every every single set of every single workout of the last week's a failure and still make it to the end of the week, but barely. Mm -hmm. Some people need to save the failure, failure stuff for the end and go maybe to RIR zero. There's a difference between RIR zero uh, and failure. The difference is, did you attempt the last rep or not? Uh, if you lock out a bench and you're like, for sure, that shit is not happening. Let's say it was the slowest grind ever and you're not even a slow grinder and you lock out rack, that's not failure. You didn't go to failure, but you knew for sure there was no rep left and everyone else was like, yeah, that's good that you racked that shit. You would have died. Failure is when you actually attempt a rep and then it falls on you and someone picks it up, right? So it might be a good idea in the first half of that week to go RIR zero. And then in the second half, on the exercise in which it's safe, granted you have a spotter or it's a machine that can't kill you, then you go to failure. Another way to look at it is maybe RIR one for the first half of the week and then RIR zero failure in the second half. It's all what you can do. And again, some people, they have one workout of that week in which they can go to all-out failure and stuff, and then they're so cooked psychologically that they just can't even show up to the gym the next day. And some other people could be like, ah, fucking easy. Six days a week of failure training, I love it. I live for this shit. So there's definitely a consideration there. And that caveat, there's a caveat there for those exercises like the leg press that I just said in that example. Like if shit's going and going good, don't even worry about those, man. Just get the gains like you're getting them, and don't worry about going to failure as a matter of principle. And then you say, but hold on, how far from um, failure were you on that leg press? Were you missing any gains? Well, hold on a sec. We said it gives you amazing pumps, super insane soreness that barely heals. Clearly stimulus is not a problem. It can't be a problem because how could you go harder than what soreness just barely heals before your next workout? If you went any harder, it would actually be too much because you would destroy the quality of your successful workout. So you don't have a stimulus problem there. But you say, okay, but how far are you really on leg press? Well, you put it in the next mesocycle, start at 425 pounds, and then ratchet up. Hey, listen, you'll hit failure sooner or later, or you'll discover that you're an immortal god and you just get, get, get to a million pounds in leg press for a million reps and you never go to failure. It's impossible <laughs> for you to fail, right? That's less likely. So that's probably my answer there is any answer is the correct answer between true failure for all sets throughout the week or adjust from there to a little bit easier earlier in the week. Some exercises may be less conducive to failure than others. For example, like squats. I mean, I'm not trying to go to failure on squats. That's yeah. really dumb. Um, deadlifts also maybe not because technical breakdown is so common in the deadlift and close to failure, mm -hmm. but like machine tricep extension. Yeah. The nothing's going to happen to you unless you know, now here's another thing. Uh, there is also some individual manipulation that you can do here intellectual for yourself. I have in previous months and years tried going to all out, get deep in the brain kind of failure on movements mm -hmm. all, you know, towards the end of the meso, that sort of thing. And I compared my results to when I just go to like pretty close to technical failure, like one or two RIR. Jared, my trainer partner would say like really eight RIR. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And I honest to God say, 
that I probably get better overall results as far as not getting hurt, psychological burnout, fatigue, growth, strength increases when I go a little on the easier end, even at the end. Mm -hmm. than I do if I go super psychotically hard. So I would try that yourself for whoever's listening. And if you notice, like when you really push it in that last week, you get great gains versus if you just don't go super hard in last week and you get so not so so good gains, hey, listen, you push. But you may find that you almost never need to go to true psychotic failure. And if you're still getting stronger over time, you solve the overload problem. So then you may never have to go super all out. I just wouldn't assume either one of those two things and play around with it. Because I think so many people overrate training to failure as like this bullshit warrior, you know, whatever, Budo mentality. And like psychology is all great and stuff, but you got to understand that when you're going to the gym with the perspective of I want to gain as much as possible, you got to take your psychology and put it aside, find out what is physiologically optimal for you, and then preferably realign your psychology to fit that. Because there's a lot of things with psychology that it's just a matter of belief and buy-in. If, uh, you know, you said, listen, I got to train all out sets to failure. And big Rami came over and he was like, bro, I never go to failure. And it's a bad idea. And you're going to get as big as me if you don't go to failure. Would you really be like, this guy's an idiot. He's never worked hard. Fuck out of my face. I'm going to be bigger than big Rami. Like, maybe not. Maybe you wouldn't do that. And if he trained at your gym and he was your training partner, he could probably get you to accept a culture of not going to failure. When you visit another gym somewhere and uh, they were like, dude, you don't go to failure, you pussy. You'd be like, do you know who the fuck I train with? You would not be able to see the sun if he stepped in this gym. They're like, bullshit. And then big Rami walks in. They're like, Ugh. so like you see this cultural element when Dorian was winning Olympias, tons of guys try to go to failure because that's what he did. When Ronnie won Olympias, tons of guys tries to go really heavy on the compound movements because that's what Ronnie did. When Jay Cutler was winning Olympias, tons of guys didn't really know what to do. Because Jay Cutler's training is set is so basic and so boring and very effective. But Jay Cutler literally told me to my face in a Las Vegas gym parking lot that he has maybe never gone to failure a single time in the gym. I mean, God damn, dude, that's hard for a lot of people to hear. Phil Heath wasn't particularly known for training ultra hard. So you can see how the culture could change and how a lot of times that desire to go like a fucking fly into a bright light to failure really starts in our heads and in our hearts. And then we use other bodybuilders to justify it so much. So that um, Jordan Peters, do you know who that is? Um, Not Jordan Peterson, the philosopher, Jordan Peters, the uh, super jacked British bodybuilder. He goes all out to psycho failure all the time. And he's been on record multiple times again, like guys, there's different ways to train. This might be effective for you. It might not. The reason I do this is because I think it's fun. And that's as far as I want you to consider that. And it's like, if he says that, how many people that idolized him after he said it were like, shit, I th- it might not be optimal. He just likes it. Damn it. Why was I mocking him the whole time? <laughs> Last thing I'll say is think with your brain, not with the Rocky Balboa side of your heart and see where that lands you. And then whatever you think is relatively optimal, adjust your psychology as much as you can to serve that purpose. Because in the end, it's all about getting super jacked, and I would just do whatever got me the most jacked, whether or not it required uh, the psychological fun of training to failure. Mm -hmm. Love how that ended up, you know, super philosophical. And (laughs) I think people got a lot of, you know, actionable tips for this for their training as well as their sex lives. Well, if I'm good for anything at all, it's (laughs) dime store useless philosophy. (laughs) Here all week for that. (laughs) That was awesome. Where can people find you, Mike? You know, mostly on YouTube nowadays, uh, Mm -hmm. Renaissance Periodization, YouTube, just type in my last name into YouTube and all kinds of funny stuff shows up. Follow the channel if you like. This is mostly just training and diet tips and more shitty analogies and terrible jokes and you get to look at my ugly ass. So subscribe to YouTube Premium so you can listen to it without seeing it because I wouldn't want to look at me for any longer than I had to. That's the deal. (laughs) And uh, for, yeah, for everyone listening, since we last spoke, I've been on, I've been a part of the team full realm form and i can say that's it's great stuff it's lurking. discussions going on yeah, lurking in the depths <laughs> the forum <laughs> needs lurkers you need people looking to, to to so that others know they're being judged without interaction <laughs> good stuff so i'll be putting those links in the description and thanks again for being on the show mike thank you so much for having me man